Welcome to Post Doom, regenerative conversations exploring overshoot grief, grounding, and gratitude. I'm your host, Michael Dowd, and this is an odd episode because it's not so much a conversation that I had with Rick Reese, Richard Adrian Reese, but Connie and I invited him to respond to our questions in a narrative form. And so he wrote out uh, his story because we're familiar with his story and it's just so awesome. We wanted it shared uh, in, in accurate depth. So uh, he wrote it out and then he recorded it himself. And uh, in, if you're not familiar, Rick Reese, Richard Adrian Reese is the most important writer on sustainability alive today. No kidding. Uh, his blog is What is Sustainable? He's reviewed, uh, extensively reviewed. He's got like four, five to six page reviews of like 200 of the best books on true sustainability, genuine sustainability. And, um, and his books include many of those. And so he's got three books, What is Sustainable, Remembering Our Way Home, Understanding Sustainability, and Sustainable or Bust. Again, his blog is What is Sustainable. But his most recent book that he's uh, offering on his blog in installments is called Wild, Free, and Happy. He's got 40 samples. So I hope you enjoy this. Rick is a soul brother in this work. Enjoy. I was born in Michigan in 1952. Back then, there were 2.7 billion humans on Earth. Five billion fewer than today. In my youth, industrial America was rapidly growing and there were few, if any, environmental regulations. I graduated from high school in 1970, several weeks after the first Earth Day and a year after the Cuyahoga River caught fire. The walleyes in Lake Erie were so contaminated with toxins that eating them was banned. The steel industry of Gary, Indiana, constantly emitted a dense, stinky orange cloud over the region. You could smell Gary from miles away. The planet was coughing up blood, and I could not pretend that this was normal. I could not deny reality. For my first English class in college, I wrote a paper. My thesis was, people aren't going to take pollution seriously until they have to wear gas masks. The harms we were causing infuriated me. I was a young lad bristling with righteous idealism. The problems were totally obvious. Way too many people were living way too hard. The remedies were also obvious. Change the way we live right now. Well, the grown-ups weren't interested and, naturally, things kept getting worse. Fifteen years later, I had a computer and modem. This allowed me to connect with many other folks and plunge into lively discussions. We searched hard to discover the miraculous silver bullet solution for the earth crisis. We passionately argued about what we should do, but we were blissfully ignorant about the scale of the mess and how we got into it. None of us went to a school where the core subjects were reading, writing, and environmental history. The blind were leading the blind. Daniel Quinn's book, Ishmael, was a story we basically agreed on. Quinn thought that a tragic turning point in the human journey was the shift to farming and herding. Until that change, for our first 300,000 years, whenever someone died, the earth was still in the same condition that it was on the day of their birth. We lived almost as lightly as all other animals. The shift to agriculture spurred population growth and environmental harm. This idea of turning point had been quietly buzzing in some dusty corners of academia. Quinn translated it into simple language and shared it with the world. The book sold well, snapped lots of minds, but the vast human herd slept through the enlightenment. The destruction kept growing. Ishmael was purely intellectual. In his book, Providence, Quinn revealed that Like most Americans, he didn't have a deep love of nature. It really didn't interest him. He was born into a crazy culture and essentially spent his life in a high-tech, man-made space station, largely isolated from the natural world. With the shift to farming and herding, humans began exerting more control over nature. 
The emerging belief in human supremacy displaced the traditional mindset that had centered on an intimate and respectful relationship with the rest of the family of life. Humans became the crown of creation. This put us on the path to the space station culture. It's very important to remember that this culture did not exist for almost the entire human journey. It's new, weird, and harmful. In a stroke of good luck, a kind friend introduced me to Tom Brown's writing. When Tom Brown was eight years old, he met Stalking Wolf, a traditional Apache elder who spent eight years teaching the lad about nature awareness, tracking, and survival. Stalking Wolf had a powerful spiritual connection to the family of life, something I had never learned in many years of Sunday school. It was illuminating to discover that some cultures had a profound respect and reverence for the magnificence of creation. I was lucky to grow up before the plague of glowing screens. Our subdivision was surrounded by forests, grasslands, lakes, and swamps. Me and my buddies built forts, climbed trees, went swimming, and were fascinated by frogs, turtles, snakes, and salamanders. Our social networking was actually face-to-face, in the here and now, and often outdoors. We were at home in nature. Learning about Stalking Wolf took my relationship with the natural world to a much deeper level. Later, in 92, I bought a cheap farmhouse in the woods near Lake Superior. For nine years, I had far more direct contact with wild animals than humans. I had never seen so many stars. I took long walks in white-out blizzards. The night music of coyotes was a joyful celebration. The northern lights were incredibly beautiful. Living in the woods was a great healing experience, the finest years of my life. In my 66 years, I've only had two brief experiences of being present in a functional community, folks who had a deep, healthy, spiritual connection to the family of life and profound respect and reverence for it. They lived among family and friends. Folks cared about each other. There was a profound sense of coherence. I'll never forget those few days when I got an illuminating glimpse of life outside the space station. I spent much of the last 30 years learning, thinking, and communicating. No TV. I got rid of my car 10 years ago. My social network includes folks from many lands who are paying careful attention to important subjects. I've read several thousand books and several thousand essays, articles, and science papers. Gradually, as I connected more and more dots, my perception of reality took a sharp turn into something like a twilight zone. The space station culture celebrated the great advances of human brilliance. Reality, on the other hand, looked like a devastating whirlwind of mindless destruction. Reality looked like a Japanese monster movie. Powerful giant reptiles were furiously smashing our space stations. The more you understand, the more you come to realize that almost nothing in our way of life is ecologically sustainable. Almost all the harm is caused by a combination of ignorance and a disconnection from the family of life, the space station syndrome. We are homeless tumbleweeds, lost and confused. Modern society is a glittering wonderland of blissful ignorance and magical thinking. Technology can solve any problem. Perpetual growth is both possible and desirable. We have no limits. Humans are the crown of creation, critters above and apart from the rest of the family of life. Life has never been better, and the best is yet to come, and so on. In my 16 years of schooling, there were no lessons in reverence and respect for the natural world. Instead, I was trained to work hard, shop hard, and elevate my social status by any means necessary. Anyway, out in the woods by the year 2000, I had learned enough to see that a man-made solution to the earth crisis was not possible. The space station mindset was a psychic epidemic that had infected most of humankind. 
It had accumulated great momentum, and nothing, nothing, nothing was going to reverse its course. We were long past the point of no return, blindly marching forward into the purifying turbulence of Helter Skelter. So be it. I was not the master of the world. At this point, my strategy changed. The space station mindset was nothing but foolish ideas, and ideas only survive if people continue believing in them. Belief is a huge threat to the survival of our species. Even the most ridiculous, insanely stupid ideas can be highly contagious, taught in every school, faithfully passed from one generation to the next, and remain fully resistant to reason, common sense, and factual reality. I am certain that this toxic mindset will eventually go extinct during Helter Skelter, as the consumer way of life sings its death song, and the human herd experiences a long overdue process of downsizing. This is the normal and necessary conclusion to an outburst of ecological overshoot. During the whirlwinds of Helter Skelter, only wild-eyed lunatics will continue believing in the wonders of technology, the amazing achievements of progress, and the omnipotence of human intelligence. Wacky notions like perpetual growth, unlimited resources, sustainable agriculture, sustainable cities, sustainable growth will get tossed into the compost bin. In the last several thousand years, the headlines in history document the rise and fall of civilizations. They grow. They live way too hard, slam into limits, and collapse. Over and over and over again, the survivors regroup and attempt to repeat the same mistakes if their ecosystem was not completely trashed. King Gilgamesh built the magnificent city of Uruk on the Euphrates River. 500 years later, it was the biggest city in the world. Today, Uruk is a crude pile of brown rubble sitting amidst a desolate man-made moonscape. Today, we continue making the same mistakes with the same results, using oil-powered technology instead of slaves. This time, we're rubbishing the entire planet, including the oceans, atmosphere, ice caps, underground aquifers, forests, and the remaining topsoil. We continue causing irreparable damage, but on an enormously bigger scale. And so, since 2000, I shifted direction. I quit searching for a miraculous solution to the Earth crisis and began thinking about humans that might survive Helter Skelter. History implies that most or all of them will attempt to repeat as many of the traditional mistakes as possible. This will not be easy in a turbulent climate, which will be far less friendly to farming and herding. Most or all of the survivors will have no competent understanding of environmental history or ecological sustainability. Luckily, I happen to know a lot about this realm of information, and in the internet age, even a humble hermit can communicate with the world. I'm now working on a book called Wild, Free, and Happy. Its mission is to delegitimize the myth of human supremacy and rewrite the human saga. In this version, humans are not the crown of creation. We're ordinary animals who innocently, with good intentions, got a bit too clever for our britches. We made a lot of boo-boos that snowballed and wrecked a lot of stuff. The book contemplates notions of homecoming, learning from our mistakes, trying to remember who we are, and humbly returning to the family of life. Anyway, it feels like an interesting and useful thing to do with my life. The Doom Age. Many believe that the Doom Age will crash into industrial civilization in the next 10 to 30 years, within the lifetime of folks now alive. Big Mama Nature is losing her patience with humans, and she's going to fetch her paddle and spank the billions who have lived far too hard. The notion of doom is a code word for the collapse of life as we know it, and its shadow, Helter Skelter. For me, doom is not an upcoming catastrophe. I see it as a process that's well underway right now and rapidly accelerating. Its result of countless half-clever innovations that gathered a lot of steam 
with the domestication of plants and animals, the development of metallurgy, the transition to fossil energy, the industrial revolution, the green revolution, the digital revolution. A highly visible aspect of the doom process is the explosive growth of the global population. It's like the old story of the sorcerer's apprentice in which an overly ambitious novice recklessly conjured a hurricane of big magic that he was powerless to stop, which soon swerved totally out of control. Similarly, in our story, with a combination of blurry intentions and poor foresight, the human mob has catapulted itself into a state of extreme overshoot. We're living during a brief blip in the human saga, an extremely sharp spike in the timeline, a one-time only joyride of astonishing decadence that can never again be repeated. Fossil biomass consists of enormous deposits of sequestered carbon. Coal was originally rainforest vegetation. Oil and natural gas come from dead phytoplankton. What we call fossil fuel is carbon that accumulated over the course of 500 million years. We're burning it up like crazy to support the survival of way too many people who live like there's no tomorrow for no good reason. Of all the carbon emitted during the entire human saga, an estimated 85% of it was released after 1945. Some estimate that more than half of it has been emitted just since 1990. A single generation has succeeded in blindsiding the ecosystems of the entire planet. I'm talking about my generation, the baby boomers. We excelled at progress, innovation, and waste. We made a huge contribution to the overshoot blip, and the winds are now howling. We built an empire fueled by non-renewable resources, and now we're enjoying a non-renewable prosperity. Sitting around their campfires, our descendants will tell frightening stories about a time when their ancestors exploded in number and went crazy. The peak of cheap energy alone seems certain to zap the blip. Even if population growth stopped forever today, the end of abundant energy would still pull the rug out from under our super crazy way of life. The high cost of oil will eventually eliminate the production of asphalt, a death sentence for maintaining modern road systems. Imagine feeding 7 billion without farm machinery, irrigation pumps, refrigerators, and transportation systems. By 2050, when 9 billion are expected for dinner, the global fuel gauge will be much closer to empty. Alone, the depletion of other non-renewable resources could hammer us. The production of many strategic minerals has peaked and is declining. For example, all life requires phosphorus. No phosphorus, no life. It takes cheap and abundant energy to manufacture, distribute, and apply the synthetic fertilizers that temporarily keep modern agriculture on life support. The production of phosphorus bearing minerals peaked in 1989, and the remaining deposits are of declining quality. Alone, water shortages could make dinner for 9 billion impossible. We're already having serious water issues, and growing urban populations will divert more and more water from the fields, while contributing more and more pollutants. Aquifers are being drained right now to irrigate arid lands, a process that has a firm expiration date. Rivers are being pumped dry. Hot weather is speeding the evaporation of reservoirs, while erosion keeps filling the reservoirs with sediment. Alone, cropland destruction could spoil the party. Soils are being depleted of nutrients. They are being carried away by water and wind. In just 200 years, the U.S. cropland has lost a third of its topsoil. Only half of Iowa's original, highly fertile topsoil is still in Iowa. Soils are being rendered infertile by salt buildup. They are being buried by urban sprawl. Deserts are expanding. The current levels of depletion are unsustainable and irreversible. 
Humans can live without oil, but not without soil, water, and air. Alone, evolution could end the joyride. Big Mama Nature is not at all fond of the brilliant nerds who work so hard to control and exploit the family of life. She takes great delight in rubbishing their latest innovations. Sooner or later, evolution provides effective antidotes for many peculiar technologies. Weeds evolve resistant to herbicides. Insects evolve resistance to insecticides. Fungi evolve resistance to fungicides. Pathogens evolve resistance to multiple antibiotics, inviting a great revival of infectious diseases. The era of antiseptic surgery will not have a long future. Evolution always sends the nerds home crying. Evolution bats last. Alone, the climate crisis could stop population growth and initiate a major downsizing. Runoff flowing down from the melting snowpack in the Himalayan peaks enables irrigation systems to provide water to crops during the growing season. This water permits the survival of 1.3 billion people. When the high elevation ice caps no longer exist, precipitation will proceed downstream immediately before the growing season. Agricultural systems cannot tolerate extended droughts or spectacular deluges. There are temperatures above which our primary grain crops cannot survive. Higher temperatures speed the evaporation of soil moisture, so crops will demand more water daily, if it is available. Climate change gets most of the attention because it's a drama queen. Heat waves, melting glaciers, wildfires, hurricanes, downpours, it's powerful and visible. Many of the other serious threats feel less dangerous, if we are aware of them at all. The public cannot see the depletion of underground aquifers, and overpumping does not immediately blindside farmers. Erosion that gradually removes tons of topsoil from a field can be invisible to everyone. The highest quality topsoil goes first, and the damage is permanent and irreversible. What would happen if a mad scientist invented a way to make cheap, unlimited energy? Economic growth might be kept on life support for a while longer, but this discovery would not arrest all of the other threats to life as we know it. Carbon emissions would continue growing as more and more methane is released by melting permafrost, and this would further destabilize the climate. Eventually, soil degradation, water shortages, climate swings, and the end of phosphorus mining would nuke agriculture. This is a game that cannot be won. Anyway, over the course of 30 years of learning, I came to the conclusion that the space station culture was not going to live happily ever after. As all wild animals clearly demonstrate, basic survival and good health does not require making plastics, metals, chemicals, glowing screens, and so on. All wild animals show us it is perfectly possible to live in the same way, in the same place, for millions of years without trashing it. What's their secret? Heading, processing the info. Many folks seem to have some sense that the world is out of balance and that their lifestyle contributes to this. The discomfort that this causes can be deflected by constantly investing mental energy in denial, daydreams, and other distractions. Folks who find the courage to learn, think, and deeply sniff realities but have a mind-expanding experience, one that is the opposite of delightful. Whiffs of full-strength reality can begin to cleanse away a lifetime of fantasies. A healing process is born. Breakdown is the loving mother of breakthrough. This awakening leads us to contemplate daunting existential questions. Of what value is all of this amazing technology if making it and using it ravages every ecosystem on the planet? Its unintended consequences are harmful to us, our descendants, and the entire family of life. It's crazy to refer to this dead-end way of life 
as a high standard of living. When I began to grasp the fullness of the darkness, despair was a perfectly appropriate response. Despair is caused by grief for the death of important fantasies. Despair is not a useful feeling to get stuck in, and it's not incurable. So I choose to bury dead fantasies, regroup, move beyond despair, and explore other paths. When we squirt out of the womb, we are wild animals, ready for life on a tropical savanna. We come into this world having the minds of wild animals. The space station culture pushes our wild minds aside. Our culture teaches us that a tiger in a zoo is still a tiger, but that's not true. The tiger and the jungle are one. The tiger in a jungle is wild, free, and where it belongs. Similarly, our culture teaches us that a human in modern Los Angeles is still a human. A Lakota elder once noted that white folks get very angry when they see trash bags dumped beside the road. They are an unsightly blemish on the land. On the other hand, white folks do not get angry at all when they see a shopping center, a far bigger blemish. This elder always avoided cities because their intense disharmony was painfully overwhelming. In Australia, the Aborigines grieve for what colonists have done to them and their sacred land. Settlers have constructed ghastly wastelands called cities. The natives know that their sacred land has not been killed. It remains alive beneath Adelaide and Sydney. The cities are nothing but ugly scabs, temporary eyesores. The land will begin a long healing process as the mass hysteria of colonial society burns itself out and eventually fades away. Heading, the post-doom age. Today, we're living in the doom age, a time of darkness and isolation. We're lost in confused space aliens, living like there's no tomorrow. Our energy-guzzling global economy has largely burned up its inheritance of strategic resources. So, our doom age can only be temporary, and nothing as ferociously destructive can ever be repeated again. Hooray! For me, the post-doom age will be a great liberation. The madness will pass. Overpopulation will be re resolved in an all-natural manner, and the healing process can proceed. The obesity epidemic will end. The rumbling of machinery will cease, and automobiles will rust in peace, and Big Mama Nature will begin composting the highways and cities. Folks everywhere will once again be able to feast on the beauty of millions of stars while listening to the music of the owls, coyotes, moving water, and passing breezes. For space station residents who now live in climate-controlled cubicles, addicted to smartphones, motorized wheelchairs, credit cards, and push buttons, this brave new world does not sound especially appealing. Sorry, an incredibly unsustainable way of life, by definition, can only be temporary. No matter how much magical thinking the human herd can summon, the future can and will be much simpler. Maybe some humans will make it through the storms. Maybe not. Cultural evolution has taken us far away from our tropical primate roots and enabled us to indulge in a wide variety of highly addictive bad habits. If we can't figure out how to live, we won't have a long future. It's essential that we learn from our mistakes. But first, we need to understand what those mistakes were. This is the purpose of my learning and writing. A huge benefit of the post-doom age is that we will have no choice but to abandon our couches, step out into the great outdoors, develop an extremely intimate relationship with our ecosystem, and try to figure out how to live in it. Rugged individualists will not do as well as folks who learn how to work together, help each other, resolve conflicts, and share. We must try to remember who we are. What remains of the family of life will continue, with or without us. To the best of its ability, 
Nature will heal in any way it can. The world is not going to die, but life as we know it will finally slip beneath the waves, never to be seen again. For more information about this project, go to postdoom.com.